to study now, okay? I don't want to preach all the time because then you fall asleep because you're so used to me preaching for 22 years. You know what's going to come out of my mouth before I say it. So I says, okay, we're going to do a, some study time. So well, why did Jesus not speak to this woman? Debbie. Okay, and there is always a combination of answers when we are looking at these types of things. So that's one of, that's one of the aspects. He was waiting to see what the rest of them are going to say. What else? Why else do you think she wouldn't, he wouldn't speak to her? Richard in the back, all the way in the back. That's our professor of ethics and history, Richard Jensen. Thank you, Richard. Wonderful answer. So that's a good answer, right? That's a good answer. Any other reasons why you think uh, he wouldn't speak to her? Isaac. Okay. Testing. In other words, you're saying he was probably testing her. Okay. Anybody else? Jews did not speak to Gentiles. You realize this, right? Rabbis did not speak to women. So this is also a factor here. You see, so there is a number of factors. Richard is right. The time was allocated to the Jewish people. Jesus' time on this earth was allocated to them, but in the cultural, historical sense, they wouldn't speak to women, especially not to pagan women. We have one more all the way in the back. He wanted to find out if she was sincere about that, to avoid all the customs, <clears throat> okay. everything else. It was her daughter, her faith. Was she really willing to break all these rules and regulations? Okay. So we're getting a picture now of the several different reasons why he wouldn't speak to her. But <clears throat> this woman wouldn't go away. So his disciples came and begged him saying, send her away for she's crying after us. And Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I think the, the, the disciples would have wanted him to just answer her prayer and send her away. And he says, no, I was, I'm not going to do it. See, some people say he would send her, when they said send her away, they meant get rid of her. I think what they meant was answer her prayer and then she'll go away. But Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do it because I was sent only to the Jewish people. You see? So even the disciples are wanting to now just get rid of her. So what? We help her. Just get rid of her. And Jesus says, no, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She is listening to all of this, this woman. So this guy doesn't want to speak to her. She asks him for help. She is listening to this, and he's clear about the fact that he's not going to help her. And then she comes, verse 25, and she kneels before him. And she says, Lord, help me. How do you feel when somebody comes to you and asks for help? I had a guy come up to me in a parking lot two winters ago, and he asked me for $5 specifically. And he told me a story, quick story, you know, what he needed it and why he needed it. And I was in a bad mood that morning. I did not have my coffee yet. And I turned to him and I said, I, this is a true story, I said, if I had a dollar for every time somebody told me this story, and I didn't even finish saying that, and he started crying. How, you know, how do you feel when somebody asks you for help and you reject them? 
how does that person feel and how do I feel? And then as soon as he started crying, I felt like, you know what, I'm not going to say it. I think I said it in the first service, <laughs> but it doesn't go out on a live stream, so I can claim I didn't say it. <laughs> but you know how I felt. You know, I felt like that. And uh, <clears throat> I reevaluated immediately and I said, look, I'm sorry, man. Uh, I thought you were just trying to scam me. He said, I never, ever asked anybody for help. And I knew at this point that he was real, and I gave him the money. You know, and I walked away feeling like, why didn't you just give him the money in the first place? You know, why did you have to make this big deal out of this and make him feel bad, make yourself feel bad? You see, I'm, why I'm saying this now, telling you this story, is because of the emotional content that was going on between Jesus and this woman. How do you feel when somebody rejects you? And how, and how do you feel when you reject somebody for, you know, when they are asking you for help? So she says, Lord, help me. We already know why she needs help. It's not for her. It's for her daughter who is possessed by a demon. And he answered, and this is the shocker, and this is the text that nobody likes. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. That's what he said to her. So he's basically calling her a dog. You see, he says it's not right. And this is nothing but pure, pure, pure racism that was, that was present in the life of the Jewish people and Gentile people. Jewish people were extremely racist towards others who were not of their, of their genetical makeup, they, they, who did not come from Abraham. Pure racism. That's how they felt, felt about anybody who was a Gentile. And especially a Gentile woman, a Phoenician woman. Number one, you're not supposed to be talking to her. Number one, they are like dogs. We don't share with them. So Jesus is now expressing the pure, unadulterated racism that is, that is just within the fabric of the Jewish lifestyle at that time. He's expressing it loudly for everybody to hear. Now, a question. If you are, let's say, um, you need a jump, and you're in a parking lot somewhere at a store, and you come up out of your car, and the first person you see some guy walks by and you say, hey, can you give me a jump? And the guy looks at you. I want you to think about this. And the guy looks at you and he says, yeah, I would give you a jump, but I don't help dogs. How, what would you say? Huh? You would say I'm not a dog? What else would you say? We have Darren in the back. You, I'm sorry, wait up, wait up, we can't hear you. I would bark at him very, very loudly, constantly, continually, until everybody else looking around, and when they looked at me, I'd point and say, Master, Master, I forgive you. You would say, I forgive you? Okay. I'm reminded of that movie in, who was it? De Niro or somebody, you talking to me? You know that movie? <laughs> so if you're a guy and somebody did this to you, there would be some kind of a, of a conflict or maybe even a physical altercation, right? There would be. If somebody called you dog for no reason, and now this woman here is, is being abused from the moment she tries to engage with Jesus. From the very first moment she tries to engage Jesus, she's being abused. First, she gets a silent treatment. Then she gets the disciples who are just trying to get rid of her. And then Jesus says, well, 
I don't help dogs. And then she says to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So now the next question that I want you to answer for me, and there is a, di a combination of answers for this one, is this. Why did she respond that way? Why did she respond that way? Why wasn't she more combative? Why didn't she stand up for herself? Why did she respond, we got Darren and we got Cheryl? Because it was her child. It was her child, Every okay. Parents, father or, mo or, or mother will do absolutely anything that they have to do, regardless of their personal feelings, for their child. A, lo a parent's love is a parent's love. Okay. Richard, do me a favor. Can you turn off the uh, swamp coolers? There are two things. On the other side, over here. There are two things in particular that I take from the Bible that the Lord teaches us. He teaches us to love him and to honor him. But he also teaches us that we must love and honor our brothers and sisters as we do him. Okay. Debbie, thank you, Cheryl. He was her only hope. Anybody else? I just want you to look at the, so before you answer, before you give any more answers, I just want you to look back at verse, at verse um, 22. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, and this is what she said. I want you to under, want us to understand the significance of this. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Kim? She knew. she knew. What did she know? You're getting the mic. <laughs> <laughs> she knew he was her savior. She knew he was her savior. Yes, Zach. She declared him to be Lord, this Gentile woman from total another culture, another region, still looked to him as her only hope. Not only that, submitted to him, said, yes, Lord. She, she the, you're right, she declared him to be the Lord in front of everybody, in front of his disciples, in front of her own countrymen, in front of everybody. So when she responded to him and says, <clears throat> yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, I believe that all of these answers are correct. He was her only choice. It was her child. You know, she only had one hope here. Uh, and, uh, and, and I also believe she knew who he was. She knew who he was. She knew that he was more than just a human being. Amen. If God comes to you and I and says, hey, Gordon, you're, you're a dog. You're behaving like a dog. You're an animal. You, you, you just don't get it. What do I do? Do I fight against God or do I submit? Do I say... Stop offending me? Or do I say, oh my goodness, I need forgiveness. Oh my goodness, I need to change my ways. You see, when you recognize that this is God talking to you, Jesus, Son of God, and you don't get offended. You actually appreciate it. Because he's taking the time to talk to you. And then Jesus says, then Jesus answered her. So there, first there was silence, remember? She came to him, she received silent treatment. And then Jesus answered her and then he says, O oh woman, great is your faith. So first she got silence 
And then after that, she was called a dog. Now, after she demonstrated her faith, she's, he is responding to her and he is addressing her in a proper, dignified manner. He, the Jewish rabbi, is talking to a Gentile woman that all of his disciples and other Jewish people regarded as a dog. Now he's turning the whole racist system upside down on its head. And he's saying, O oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was immediately, instantly healed. What do you learn from this? whole story. And I mean you personally, when you, as we have gone through this a little bit, what do you think are the lessons here? For us. What do you learn, what, what do you feel is the lesson for you personally, Teresa? I think patience and perseverance. Um, I think it's easy to ask for something and in today's culture just expect um, instant gratification. And I think it's important to ask and to wait and to listen and c to continue to have that perseverance for a matter of faith. Mm -hmm. Very good. I think that the more we spend in the Word, the Bible, and the closer we become in our walk with the Holy Spirit leading, guiding, and directing us in our life and with God, the more we understand and we become closer to Him. But we have to have that faith and trust in Him in all things in our life, not just when we go through bad times, but even in good times that the amount of time that we spend with him is so vitally important. And especially as we are knowing that one day we're gonna stand before him and there's gonna be a time that we're not gonna have Bibles to read. So it's got to all be stored in our mind and in our hearts. And so I just ask and encourage people as I pray to the Lord every day to give me that wisdom and direction and discernment upon his word. Mm, amen. Thank you. Well, the words patience, perseverance, and faith have been said, but the determination to never, ever give up. Mm. It doesn't matter if it, the prayer hasn't been answered in a month, six months, a year, five years, 10 years, 14 years, 20 years. You never, ever give up. You continually pursue that faith, you pursue that trust, you pursue that hope, and you know that the Lord's timing is not your timing, so don't give up. Even if you feel that you're being rejected. Okay. Is there anybody else? Something that stood out for you in this, in this uh, encounter that we just looked at? Okay. Jesus I want to go through this paper, and this is in the lobby. You can have it if you want. Uh, this is only t going to take five minutes. Jesus encounters a Canaanite Syrophoenician woman who begs him to cure her daughter. He initially refuses her request by saying it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Taken out of context, and especially in English, it's easy to mistake this for an insult. In the flow of the story, however, it is clear Jesus is creating a metaphor meant to explain the priorities of his ministry. He is also teaching an important lesson to his disciples. By the way, this is a very good explanation of this text. I wish you grab yourself a copy before you leave. Jews in Jesus' day sometimes referred to Gentiles as dogs. In the Greek, they used the word uh, kuon, meaning wild cur like a wild dog, you see, an animal that's going to tear apart whatever it comes across. Non-Jews were considered so unspiritual that even being in their presence could make a person ceremonially unclean. But much of Jesus' ministry 
involves turning expectations and prejudices on their heads. According to Matthew's narr narrative, Jesus left Israel and went into Tyre and Sidon, which was Gentile territory. When the Canaanite woman approached and, repeat and repeatedly asked for healing, the disciples were annoyed and asked Jesus to send her away. At this point, Jesus explained his current ministry in a way that both the woman and the watching disciples could understand. At that time, his duty was to the people of Israel, not to the Gentiles. <clears throat> Recklessly taking his attention from Israel in violation of his mission would be like a father taking food from his children in order to throw it to their pets. Now, the exact word Jesus used here in Greek was kunarion, meaning a small dog or a pet dog. It's not the same word that they use to describe the Gentiles as wild dogs, you see. So Jesus is using a different word here, a pet dog. This is a completely different word from the term kuon used to refer to unspiritual people or to an unclean animal. And then there is this point that I think is important. Jesus frequently tested people to prove their intentions. And you, you're going to see this in the scriptures many times. Often through response questions or challenges. His response, his response to the Canaanite woman is similar. In testing her, Jesus declined her request. My dad always told me, and I think I told you this. My dad always told me, you never know what people think about you, he says. He, my dad came from this small village, you know. Uh, and they were, um, they knew how to evaluate people, you know. And he would say to me when I was growing up, he would say to me, you never know what people think of you. If you want to find out what people think of you, deny them when they request something. Challenge them a little bit. And then you're going to see what they really think about you. And you, you know, you do that sometimes. You, somebody asks you for a favor. Say no, and you're going to find out what they really think about you. Because if you always do what everybody wants you to do, then they're never going to tell you how they really feel about you, because you're always good to them. Try not being good one, once or twice. Try challenging their cherished views once or twice. Then they're gonna, it's going to come out. So Jesus is testing her. He wants to see if she's real, or if she is just coming to him for the benefit. Does she really believe that he is God? The son of God? Or did she just hear these stories that this guy is a healer. So I'm going to go to him and get something out of him. And I'm going to tell him whatever he wants to hear just so I can get something out of him. So Jesus says no. I'm not going to help you. And she doesn't fall for that. You see, usually at that point, you know, if somebody asks you for help and you say, hey, you know what, I've been helping you a hundred times. I'm not going to help you anymore. Most likely they'll turn around and they'll say, well, you're a jerk. You're a big fat jerk. You know, right? But she doesn't do that. First he gives her a silent treatment. She doesn't jump on him. Then he calls her a dog, offends her. She doesn't fall for that either. And she finally says to him, look, I understand who you are. I know you came for the Jewish people. She understood the grace because she's saying, I know you came for the Jewish people and if you really are a God, Paraphrasing now, obviously. If you really are a God that came to bring grace to the Jewish people, if that grace is real, there ought to be a little bit of it for me too. You see? That's what she's saying. So she really believes. So once he tested her, and once he realized the purity of her heart, although Jesus knew all of this from the beginning, well, I think he's doing it for for his disciples because you know pretty soon he's going to be telling them to go into the world and preach this gospel to all creation that means Jews and Gentiles 
So he's giving them a lesson here. See, in Mark 16, verse 15, Jesus says to them, go into the whole world and preach this gospel to all creation. So now he's getting them used to this idea. You got to go out there and preach to everybody, Jews and Gentiles. You see? Why? Because the grace of God is for everybody. So you may think that, you know, people don't like you. They may even call you a dog. Some people may be racist towards you because you're of a different culture or a different nationality. You see, some people, you may be going to God asking for help and your, your requests are being declined. There is no answer, you know. Where are you going to go from there? Is God maybe testing you to see if you're going to start screaming and cussing at him, yelling? We get to that point too sometimes in our life. Even that happens. A friend of mine was, uh, was losing his mother. At the same time, his wife was pregnant. And he says to me, I'm just praying that my mom will be alive just long enough to see the baby. And she wasn't. We get instances in life when we get seriously mad and angry at God. We lose friends. Kim lost three friends a week ago, all in the same week. Young people, too. And it's easy then to, you know, but even, we, even we, if we get mad, even if we scream and cuss and yell at God, the grace is abundant for Jew and for a Gentile. And for a sinner of any sort. But the question is, do I have that same humility that she had and persistence and faith that she had? That God actually will accept me and that God actually will work in my life. Do I have those three things? Humility, persistence, and faith. So, G, so in testing her, Jesus declined her request and explained that she had no legitimate expectation of his help. None of us has a legitimate expectation of God's help. Don't deserve it. Don't deserve it. The woman, however, lived out the principle Jesus himself taught in the parable of the persistent widow. Her response proved that she understood fully what Jesus was saying, yet, yet she had enough conviction to ask anyway. And maybe, maybe in your own ear, somebody saying, you don't deserve this. You don't deserve this. You don't deserve this. You're, you're not good enough. Don't go there. Don't go there. You don't deserve it. You see, that's what Satan does. You don't deserve it. But she had enough conviction to ask anyway. And Jesus then acknowledges her faith he calls her faith great, and he grants her request. So according to both the context and language involved, Jesus wasn't referring to the Kenite woman as a dog, either directly or indirectly. He wasn't using an epithet or racial slur, but making a point about the priorities He'd been given by God. He was also testing the faith of the woman and teaching an important lesson to his disciples. Yes, sir. I just want to pull out a point, too. He did call, you emphasized on it, um, he did call her faith great, being a Gentile woman as well. I, just, I, I heard you touch on that this morning. I think that was pretty neat. Can you uh, remind me? Yeah, you just pointed out how 
infrequent that specific statement was in scripture. Mm -hmm. And the few times that it was attributed, it was usually referred to or given right, to right, right. a Gentile. I remember now. Yeah, we have two services and no two sermons are the same. So there were things I said in the early service that I didn't say in this one. And there are probably things that we talked about in this one that we didn't. But the topic was the same. But yeah, that's a good point. How many, how often in the scriptures do you hear your, great, your faith is great? This is a great faith. And think about this now that he reminded me. He says it to this woman. He says it to the centurion, right, uh, who is also a non-Jew. He says it to the Samaritan woman. You know what I mean? I mean, Jesus is saying your faith is great to these people that are not Jews. And yet at the same time, his own disciples are with him, watching him walk on water. Raising dead people from, from the dead, healing the blind, and he's struggling to get them to believe. Yeah. Most common phrase actually is, oh ye of little faith. Oh ye of little faith. That's actually the most common phrase. And you know, this is a point that uh, I want to finish on. Disciples were with Jesus all the time. They saw all the miracles, and yet their faith was always lacking. Always. He sent them out to do some miracles and heal, and they couldn't do it. And Jesus told them, oh, you of little faith, you see. And I think the same thing happens to us. We go to church week after week, and we get so used to God being in our life that pretty soon we don't realize, we think that there is nothing miraculous about it anymore. You know, I'm thinking about this radio thing that we just had and uh, how we, in three weeks we raised the money to be on air for 15 months, you know, in spite of me because I didn't want to do it. I did it half kind of, you know, ah, okay, you know, and, we, and then he, all of a sudden it happens. And I think about other things that we've done in this church, you know, the ministries and the, and the television program and the food bank and the street beat and Indonesian church started and Spanish church started one and second and three Spanish churches sprouted from this congregation here and two Indonesian churches and the Adventist Mission Center in Aurora, you know, and I'm looking at all of these things, and every once in a while I come, I just, I, I just don't see it as a miracle anymore. I just see it as something that, oh, we do that, you know. And then, I, and then I read a story like this, and I realize we didn't do any of that. It's God that's doing it. And in our personal lives, too, how often do we, we just get used to God being there and we don't see anything miraculous about our own lives anymore. Disciples, I mean, they see Jesus walk on water. I mean, what more do you need? They see a blind person sing. They see a dead person get up out of the casket and walk. And they, it has become so common and so present in their life that they didn't see it as a miracle. They did, it, didn't, it didn't raise their, the level of their faith. And this woman who didn't see any of this, she just heard rumors. You know, she comes and the Holy Spirit reveals to her that this is a Lord, Son of God, Messiah, a, a supernatural being. And she, you know, and this is how we need to relate to God. Not like the disciples, not like common Christianity, you know, it just goes through the motions and steps. But like this woman, I mean, we should be praising God for all of the great things that he's doing in our church, in our lives, in our personal lives, with our family, with our friends, with the little things, the successes that we have. We're praising him for all of those things. 
And I believe that uh, if we did that, then Jesus would look at us and say, wow, you guys have some faith here. You guys have some faith. You don't just assume that this is just some random event. So let's not be random event Christians where we just think that everything is just normal. Because it's not normal. What God is doing in your life, in my life, and in the life of our churches is not normal. It's not every day. It's not ordinary. So that's what I'm going to leave you with. God bless you. Amen. Real quick before we do our last song, um, we didn't hear about Street Beat, but there's Street Beat today. Would you like to tell us about it? Today, today is Street Beat. And we're going to the Salvation Army down in Denver, where we've been going for a few months. And we'll leave the church here at 3.30. So people have time to go and get something to eat and come back. And we do need um, some bottled water, if anybody feels so inclined. That'd be great. I got to make one more announcement. I keep forgetting to say this. We are doing a... We are going to Indonesia at the end of October on an evangelistic effort. And our Indonesian church, several people are going, several people from this church are going, is going to be at the very end of October. And uh, I'm going to email the dates and the specifics to everybody. If you want to go, you can go for a week. You can go, I'm going to be there for two weeks. First week we are doing preaching and baptisms and all of that stuff. And second week, we are going to be helping at the local school there with building projects and whatnot. You know. So if you're interested in that, email me or call me, and uh, I'd love to have you go with me.